Good morning. It literally is a good morning this morning. We're going to be singing uh, today about the goodness of God. So you'll notice a lot of the songs we're going to sing today have good in the title. And that's really an appropriate thing for us to do because we do serve a God who is good, who is gracious and loving and kind. And we want to celebrate that together this morning. So we stand with us as we sing Good Grace.
Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, it's on now. I hear it. Testing. There we are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Thornydale Family Church. We're very, very glad you're here today. If you're joining us in person, if you're here for the very first time and visiting, we do have this connection card that we would like you to fill out and let us know who you are so we can minister to you more. If you're joining us online, there is a, an online connection uh, uh, capability <coughs> for you as well. Uh, and again, if you are joining us for the very first time, we just want to extend, extend a very special welcome to you. Um, again, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're online, I'll also be acting as one of your online hosts, along with Lauren Hawthorne, who's one of our, um, our elders as well. So if you have any questions, if you're joining us, if you have anything you need during your time, please let us know. Um, and while you're here in person, one of the things we talk about very frequently here at Thornydale is worship is a participative environment, and it's something that we, we call it, you know, it's not a spectator sport, right? So we do invite you and ask that you just participate. So as we're singing, please sing out to the Lord. This is our time to, to reach out into the heavens and reach out to him and to worship in spirit and truth. So we invite you to do that with us. While we're reading, read with us. While we're praying, bow your heads and just connect with the Father during that way. We just sang about how good he is, and we've been singing about that all morning. So go ahead and just join us as we continue to worship. Thank you.
for how good you are, for your grace that's in our lives every day. Thank you for goodness that you shower on us, Lord. You are the Father unfailing. You do not change like shifting shadows. Every single thing that you bring into our lives is there for a purpose. It's there for a reason. You love us, and you shower your Holy Spirit into each life, Lord. Thank you for the guidance of your Holy Spirit today and all days. Thank you that you who created the universe are busy forming Christ's character within us, shaping us to be your hands and your heart and your serving feet in the world, Lord. Send us where you want us to go. Help us to be good as you are. Lord, form in us your perfection, your beauty, and your love, and let us worship you with it. And may all the glory go to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Good morning. Come on up, kids. Anyone that wants to come on up here. Now, I got a, a question for you this morning. Do any of you guys know how to braid? Like to braid hair, braid a rope? Elizabeth does, right? No? You guys don't know how to braid? Mia probably does, right? So let's say I have these two ropes here. And I wanted to braid these two ropes together. Can anyone show me how can you braid two ropes together? You could just twist them, but what happens when I'm done? They untwist, right? Now, how about if I bring a third rope in? Now, can you braid them? Does anyone want to try it? Give it a shot. Okay, Mia, come on over. There you go. So what happens now when you get the third strand in there is let's say we got this to the end and we tied it off. This won't come apart now, right, because there's a third strand in there. And today we're going to be talking about relationships that we have with other people. We're going to be talking about the fact that we want to make Jesus the center. He's like this nice white rope here of the relationships. The Bible actually tells us that in the book of Ecclesiastes it says that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And that means that we have Jesus as the center of our relationships. We're going to be talking today about some ways that we can do that. And so um, as you listen today, be thinking about how you can put Jesus at the center of your relationships, how he can be that third strand that can really connect you with other people. So let's pray and ask him to help us do that. Father, we do pray for that. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he does want to be that third strand in our relationships. Show us today how we can do that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, really from uh, 
the beginning of time, God has always called his people to live lives that are different and distinct from the world around them. And, and that really hasn't changed today, but it sometimes becomes really difficult to do that, right? We live in a culture that, that no longer really holds to some of the, the biblical principles that it once did, and so it's really hard to live out the things that we find in the Bible. But you know what's really interesting is that was also the case 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote the letter to the church at Colossae, the one that we've been studying now for several weeks. And, um, and so this morning we're going to look at a passage that, that really helps us to develop the kind of, of relationships that uh, make it possible for us to live these kind of distinct and different lives, even in a world that, that really doesn't help us to do that very much. We're in this second part of, of the book of Colossians now, this section in which we've been seeing how Paul takes the doctrine that we found in the first part of the letter and, and he makes it really practical for us now. He says, based on the fact that Jesus is supreme over all his, his creation, based on the fact that he's the head of the church, now here is how you ought to live your lives. And last week, we began, we, we saw that, that in this section, he says, the way that you're supposed to do that he says you need to dress in a manner that's consistent with who God made you to be. And that means that you have to take off some of the old things in your life, and then you have to put on some new things. On well, the passage that we're going to look at today, Paul's going to drill down even a little bit further into what that looks like. And he's going to talk about the most intimate relationships that we have. And he's going to show us how putting Jesus at the center of those relationships, like we just talked about with the kids, makes it possible for us to live these lives that are distinct and different in a culture that makes that increasingly hard for us to do. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at the last part of chapter 3. And uh, into the first part of chapter 4, the first verse there. So you can go ahead and follow along as I read. I'm going to begin reading in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Here's what Paul writes. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from your Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. There's, there's a lot in this passage, isn't there? He, uh, he addresses here what would have been the, the family or the household relationships back in that culture. And, and this is one of those sections where we could very easily look at all these relationships that are there. There are three main ones that he's going to talk about, and we could, we could easily make this into three messages, or if we wanted to cover both sides of every relationship, we could make it into six messages. I'm not going to do that to you. What we want to do today is kind of like we've done it with a couple of the other passages here. We want to kind of take a step back. And I want us to look at these overall principles that we find here. And in order to do that, we really need to understand what the culture was like back in Paul's day. If we don't understand that, we're going to make some mistakes about how we take and, and we apply the passage that we're going to see here before us today. The first thing that, that, that we need to understand there is that, that these are household relationships that he's talking about here. Today, a lot of these things are kind of separated, but back then they really weren't, and that's particularly true with the master-slave relationship. Most of us probably tend to think of that in terms of, of what we know from history of slavery here in the United, United States and around the world, but, but the kind of slavery that existed back then was completely different than that. 
It had nothing to do with race or ethnicity or anything like that. As a matter of fact, by the, when Paul's writing this, probably about half the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Often those slaves would be more educated and, and more well-trained than their masters, and they, they would often perform really important tasks within the household. Even, even people like doctors and lawyers could be slaves. And they would actually live in the same household with the people that they, what, that they served. And so it was really nothing like what we think about slavery. It was really probably closer to, to what we have today in an employment situation between an employer and an employee. Nothing like the, the historical that we know. The other thing to, to understand is, is in that culture that men ruled the roost. They really did. I mean... The, They were the only ones that had rights. Women didn't have rights. Kids didn't have rights. Slaves certainly didn't have rights. And so they kind of ruled everything. And a lot of people think that that when Paul writes this, that that he's really demeaning women. But we're going to see as we go through this passage that that is not the case at all. So here's the main idea that we're going to develop today from this passage. To be rooted in Christ I must put Jesus at the center of my closest relationships. If I want to be rooted in Christ, just like I shared with the kids this morning, we need to put Jesus at the center of those relationships. And we kind of talked about the the what earlier with the kids, so we need to put Jesus there. But the question is exactly how do I do that? How do I make sure that Jesus is that, that third cord, that he's that third strand? And so this morning, we're going to use this passage to help us to understand how we can do that and to develop some principles out of that. And as I said earlier, I'm not going to focus so much on the individual relationships. I'm going to focus on the big ideas. And the reason that's really important is that I know what's going to happen. Some of you this morning are going to be really tempted to just tune me out. For a couple of reasons. One, you might say, well, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I think you all have parents, right? I think that's probably true. I'm not a slave. I'm not a master. Maybe you don't even work anymore. So you're going to be tempted to tune tune me out because you think it doesn't apply. The other reason that you may be tempted to tune me out is because some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, it might offend you. It might make you mad. And the reason for that is, is it's so contrary to what we've been taught often in this culture. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong. And so here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to make me a promise that you won't tune me out. You'll listen all the way through the end of the message, and then and and only then will you begin to make some decisions about these principles in your life. And my guess, and matter of fact, I'm really confident that if you'll do that, that God's Holy Spirit will work in your heart. He will take these truths into your heart so that you not only tolerate them, but so that you're willing to embrace them into your lives. So how do I put Jesus at the center of my relationships? Here's the first thing that I need to do. I need to consider the other person as an equal who is worthy of dignity. The other person as an equal who is worthy of dignity. As I said earlier, that that men really ruled the roost in this culture. They, they were the only ones that, that had rights. And yet, Paul comes along and he's going to give women great dignity. A lot of people, they, they don't believe the things that Paul writes here because they, they feel like the things that are written here really demean women, that they demean the worth of women. We've been told that in our culture, but frankly, nothing could be further from the truth here. Paul is actually giving great dignity to women, and we're going to see that as we go through this passage today. As a matter of fact, one of the ways he gives dignity to women, he begins this passage by talking directly to the women here. And he makes it really clear that these these women have dignity, that they're equal to men. This is true in the church. We saw that last week, didn't we, when Paul was, was writing about how we're all one in the church, and he, 
And he makes that really clear also in his letter to the church at Galatia when he writes this. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no what? No male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is that within the body of Christ, we're all equal. Men and women, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. We're all equal. We all have dignity before God because God created every single one of us. Now, that doesn't mean, however, that there aren't different roles within the body of Christ and within the different relationships that we have. And that's what we're going to see this morning. There are some different roles, but that does not mean that these people aren't equal, that they're not worthy of dignity. So he begins here and he writes to the women. And he says to the women, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And for us to really understand this, we need to understand what the word submit means. And we also need to understand what it does not mean. Or we're going to make some wrong assumptions here. You know, Paul, Paul could have chosen a lot of different words here. And he chose this specific word submit. It was a a military term, it, it kind of describes someone like in our day, it would be somebody who enlisted in the military and who voluntarily agreed to be under the authority of someone else. It does not equal obey. It got, Paul could have used that word. As a matter of fact, he does use it when he's talking to children. He tells them to obey their parents. He doesn't say that to the women. I think probably the best way to describe what this word means is it's really a voluntary trust. The woman is to voluntarily put herself under her husband and trust that he has her best interest at heart. And it's important to note here that Paul doesn't say, women, you're to submit to all men. This is only to be done within the relationship. This isn't something that's that he calls the entire culture to do. This is something that's supposed to happen within the marriage relationship. And it gives great dignity to both the husband and the wife. And Paul doesn't stop there. You know, in his culture, there was a, there was a, you could find a lot of places you could go and find instructions to women about how they were supposed to relate to their husband. But outside the Bible, you will find almost nothing that tells the husbands how they're to treat their wives. So what Paul is writing here is revolutionary, and he says to the husbands, he says, husbands, you're to love your wives. So what does that mean, to, to love your wives? What does that look like? Fortunately for us, in the, in the parallel passage we see in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul makes this really clear. Here's what he writes there. He says, husbands... Love your wives, how? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, most of you probably know the word love here is the Greek word agape. It's describing a, a kind of love that's more than just a feeling. It's more than just an emotion. It's a choice we make to put the, the, the needs of the other person, the wants of the other person, we put those ahead of our own. It's a choice that we make. And obviously, Jesus is the, is the prime example of that. He willingly gave himself up on the cross for us because he loved us. He made a decision to do that. And Jesus is also the, the greatest example of the fact that, that just because women have a different role than men, that they are they're not inferior to men in any way, shape, or form. Think about this. Jesus is equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Would you all agree with that? He's equal with them. He has equal worth with, with both of them. And yet, his role was to voluntarily submit himself to the will of the Father and come to this earth and to give up his life on a cross for you and for me. Does that make him worth any less than God the Father or God the Holy Spirit? Of course not. 
And the same thing is true in these relationships that we see here. We see in all these relationships that we have two equals coming together and that, that in these relationships, our goal is to protect the dignity of the other person in that relationship. And I'm not going to spend as much time talking about it, but we see the same thing in the relationship between parents and children and in the relationship between slaves and masters. Paul makes it really clear here that they are equals and that they should be given great dignity. And that really leads us into the next idea that we're going to talk about this morning, that, that if I want to put Jesus at the center of my relationships, that I have to protect the most vulnerable person in those relationships. You know, we live in a world where the rich and the powerful and the strong and the, and the famous, they often exploit other people for their own good, right? But Paul says, no, you're not to do that. If you're in in some kind of a a, a position where you have the ability to do that, instead what you're supposed to do is you're to protect the most vulnerable person in that relationship. That's what it means for husbands to, to love your wives. Part of that role is to protect your wives where they're most vulnerable. Peter writes more about this in 1 Peter 3. Uh, verse 7, he writes this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So what's he saying here? He's, he's, first of all, he's not saying the woman is inferior in any way. That's not what he's saying here. She's still an equal, but he also says that the woman tends to be the weaker vessel. And that can happen in a number of different ways, right? I think he's primarily talking about physical strength. I mean, in general, women are physically just not as strong as men. That's just a fact. But I think he's also pointing out that can happen emotionally and and spiritually too. This week I was reading, there was a study done on cults, and they found that in, in general, about 70% of the people who ended up in a cult were women. And part of that is just because that's who the world preys on. They're, they're, in a sense, they can be more vulnerable spiritually and emotionally. And the job of the husband in that relationship is to be, uh, like one of the translations basically says, you're to be a student of your wife. You're to understand who she is. You're to understand where she's vulnerable, and then you're supposed to do everything you can in your power to protect her in those areas. And the same thing is true in the other relationships we see here, isn't it? Parents, you're responsible for protecting your children where they're the most vulnerable. If you're an employer, you're responsible for protecting your employees where they might be most vulnerable. And if you aren't part of any of those relationships, which is why I'm trying to look at the big picture this morning, the idea is that you might be in some relationship where you you hold the upper hand on someone else, whether that's financially or whether that might be emotionally or maybe in some other way. And your responsibility is to make sure that you don't take advantage of that and harm the other person. Instead, you're supposed to look out for them where they're most vulnerable. The third thing here that's really important is that I need to do my part even when the other person doesn't. And this might be the most important thing that we all need to learn today. It's really interesting, isn't it? Not one of the commands that Paul gives us in this section is conditional. (coughs) Pardon me. He doesn't say, wives, if you have loving husbands, go ahead and submit to them, does he? He doesn't say to the husbands, husbands, as long as your wives go ahead and submit, then you love them. He doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't say to the children, children, if your parents don't provoke you, then go ahead and obey them. But otherwise, you don't have to. He doesn't say that. He says, obey them in all things. And to the parents, he doesn't say, don't provoke your kids as long as they obey. He says, excuse me, don't provoke them, period. And then the slave-master relationship. He doesn't say to the slave, if you have a good boss, go ahead and 
work hard. He says, you work hard no matter what. And to the master, he says, treat your slave fairly and justly, even if they're not the best worker. You know, most of the time, when we get into some kind of conflict with someone else, what do we want to do? We want to fix the other person. Or we want God to fix the other person. And what we need to be doing is make sure that we're obeying what God tells us regardless of what that other person is doing. This next passage here, we see that um, one measure of our relationship with God is, is how well we love other people. Somewhat, if you say to someone, I love God, but you don't love other people, then the Bible says you're a liar. Here's what it says in 1 John. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God with whom he has not seen. I think there's actually a slide missing, isn't there? That's really the last point. I'm sorry I somehow missed that. The last idea here would be that I need to treat others in a way that brings glory to God. That's the one that's missing. Treat others in a way that brings glory to God. You'll notice that every single one of these commands here, it's accompanied by something related to Jesus Christ. For instance, it says to the wife, submit to the, your husband's what? As is fitting in the Lord. So every one of these connections, it's, every one of these commands is connected back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're, it's, he's just pointing out once again <clears throat> that if we make Jesus the center of our lives, if we get Jesus right, then everything else is going to be right, including our relationships. And so we need to love other people in a way that's going to bring glory to God. And as, a, as that verse says, if if I say I love God, but I'm not loving other people in a way that brings glory to God, then I'm a liar. I would go so far as to say this. Your relationships with other people, with the, the people that are closest to you, are going to be do one of two things. Either they're going to be an act of worship that brings glory to God, or they're going to be rebellion against God that's going to rob him of his glory. So we've seen this morning that to be rooted in Christ, I must put Jesus at the center of my closest relationships, whatever those might be. I need to put Jesus at the center. So that means whether you're married or single, whether you have kids or you don't have kids, whether you're, work, whether you're working or not, you all have relationships that you can take and apply these principles in those relationships. Now, as we close, I want to make this really practical for us. So, so how do I get started with that? I'm going to share with you three things that are really simple ways that I think you can go ahead and you can get started to apply these principles in your life. Number one, I need to honestly evaluate my part in my relationships. You know, when Mary and I were first married, if we had some kind of conflict or an argument, my goal was always, I'm going to win the argument, and I'm going to prove that I'm right. I'm sure none of the rest of you have ever done that, right? Whether it be with your spouse or with some other kind of relationship. But what I learned over time was that I was always at least a good part at fault in whatever was going on. And so rather than asking God to... To fix the other person, what I had to ask God was, show me what my part is in this relationship. God, show me where I'm not treating the other person as an equal who's worthy of dignity. God, show me where I'm robbing God of his glory in this relationship. God, would you show me where I'm taking advantage of the vulnerability in this other person? And as, that, as you pray that prayer, I believe God will answer that. And when that happens, you're going to probably need to do both of the other things that I'm going to suggest to you. The next thing that you need to do after you do that is that when needed, you need to seek forgiveness. And my guess is that even if you think the other person is 99% responsible for the problem, 
guess what? You're, you still have some responsibility. And you're, you're, frankly, you're probably not seeing things very well anyway because you, you probably have just as much or more fault. And so when that happens, what do you need to do? You need to go and seek forgiveness from the other person and from God and do it quickly. Don't allow things to fester. The longer that you fail to do that, the more likely that relationship is to suffer harm. So you need to seek forgiveness. You need to ask God, show me what I've done wrong, and then let me make sure that I seek forgiveness from you and from the other person. And then the opposite side of that is when needed, I also need to grant forgiveness to other people. I need to forgive someone who has wronged me. And again, Jesus says, don't do that because the other person deserves it. He says, the reason that you're to forgive someone else is, guess what? I've forgiven you, and you didn't deserve it one bit, and so you need to love other people the same way I've loved you, and you need to be willing to grant forgiveness even if the other person doesn't deserve it. And guess what? When you fail to do that, who gets hurt? Not the other person. We think we're somehow hurting them. Who are we hurting? We're hurting ourselves. One of the really interesting things about our closest relationships, whatever those might be, is that I think they're both good barometers of our relationship with Jesus as well as probably a place where we can really develop those relation, that relationship with Jesus even further, right? It's those closest relationships where I learn to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in my life. It's those closest relationships where I I begin to understand just how much Jesus loves me and how much He's forgiven me. It's in those closest relationships that, that I have the ability to to give people worth and dignity just the way that Jesus has done for me. And if that's the case, then that seems to me like that's a pretty good place to invest some of our time and our energy and our resources. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the relationships that you bring into our lives, whatever those might look like. It's going to be different for every single one of us. Father, help us to make Jesus that that center cord in those relationships. Help us to apply some of the principles that we've talked about today so that we might develop those relationships in a way that would bring glory and honor to you. Father, that's our goal. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's anything we can do to help you to apply these principles in your life, let us know. Or maybe this morning God just put it on your heart that you know you've never really committed your life to Jesus, and he's been putting that on your heart maybe for a long time, and you need to make that decision. We're here to help you do that. Maybe there's something else you need to do in your life to to join the church or to be baptized or, or take some other step in your walk with Jesus. Whatever that might be, we're here to help you. But we can't do that unless you let us know. So so please, there's so many different ways to contact us. I'm not going to go through all of them. You guys hear this almost every week. But just let it, we just want to let you know that we are here for you. Each week as we close our time, we also have a time of offering. It's a time when we give back to God out of the abundant resources that he has entrusted to us. It's an act of gratefulness. It's an act of worship. And as always, we just invite you to speak to God about that and to give as he would lead you. Finally, would you go ahead and stand with me for our benediction this morning? It comes from John chapter 13, and in light of uh, what we've talked about this morning, I can't think of a more appropriate passage. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And all God's people said,